graduate, graduate, 60, 72. I went that way, and you went the other way. So you'll use images for the intro. Yeah, and Rem's doing what? Rem's got images for the intro also. <clears throat>
Are you ready? Okay, everybody. I think we're uh, <coughs> we're ready to begin the evening. Um, it is uh, you know a great pleasure, and on behalf of everybody today, to welcome back to the school this evening Peter Eisenman on my right and Rem Coolhouse on my left. Um, <coughs> two people who who have, of course, long been a part of the AA and visitors at different times in its recent history, who've lectured here in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And more recently, and it's great to welcome them both back together this evening for what I think will be a very, very interesting conversation between the two of them around a series of topics that we've been discussing the last few weeks between ourselves to kind of set up um, <clears throat> the first of what I hope are very many dialogues in the next few years between these two people, but also between themselves, their work, and things that are going on in a larger architectural culture around the world. Um, <clears throat> last spring, when I, when I presented some ideas to the school, I think one of the things that I said to everyone was, was an interest many of us here have in creating platforms of different kinds at the school. I can't imagine a better kind of platform than, to set than the sort of uh, floppy MDF platform that we're on tonight that brings together two people <laughs> to talk across ideas and topics and to connect some things in different ways uh, that might sometimes at first glance appear divergent or even contradictory, but I think we'll find as we work through some of these um, connect in interesting and important ways. Uh, I, I've pulled out a few images to do a five or ten minute introduction to help set the mood in this, uh, in the amazing uh, series of rooms that we're all in tonight. Um, and just to remind Peter and Rem, we have a crowd of people below us uh, in a large room there and immediately above us in the library and on a floor above that that are all part of this presentation tonight. Um, and if nothing else, we've got plenty of cross-programming still going within the AA. Um, uh, a couple of images from Peter in the 1970s here, I think in 1975 in this room, presenting some work related at the time to the work of New York Five. <clears throat> About the same time, uh, Rem and one of his students that you might recognize next to him um, at a Ken Frampton lecture in this room in 1976. And it's, it's hard to make it out in, the, in this picture that I've used a lot in lectures on the left, Rem, but that's you in your first lecture here as a teacher in this room in 1976 or 77, I think it was, presenting the work that would become the basis for an article that year, The Culture of Congestion. Um, to say something about what tonight won't be about, <laughs> this is not an evening to try and argue for winners and losers. In fact, I think it's almost the opposite. Um, we're very fortunate tonight to have two people who um, not only stand up for and argue for the possibility of a critical project in their thinking and work today, um, and in that way are absolute expert critics of their own work. Um, in addition to that, I think over the last 20 or 30 years, in an interesting way, they've each become expert critics of each other's work. And I think that's part of what makes possible tonight's conversation at the sort of level I think we'll be able to carry it through. <coughs> Um, what we're trying to look past very much is a kind of cult of either personality or signature, which I think many students in this room will know these people in relation to, and to try and shift attention towards this kind of activity, to the kind of work that goes into the sort of projects that you all know these architects in relation to. <clears throat> and I think to go through these kinds of images with Peter on the left and Rem on the right, there's all kinds of convergences and connections, I think, across the two. They're fascinating to try and work through. Um, and they've been doing that, in fact, in various ways in different settings over the last several years. Um, and we're going to carry some of that forward tonight. I mean, as I was putting together pairs of images for this short introduction, the kinds of discoveries I found looking at the work again that, that seem very interesting is, for example, the overwhelming presence of modeling as a kind of project within each of their critical practices. They use models in very different ways, but it's a fundamentally a kind of modeled space. Um, even to compare a set of images like this of Peter's exhibition at the MAC last year at Vienna and a couple of years ago, OMA's work at, uh, at the NAI. Um, well, arguably, they're two very different kinds of spaces. Um, one of the compelling things about each is the way in which they are an architectural project in and of their own. Um, terms. Um, instead of it being an exhibition about architecture, each architect is argued for, even in settings like this, forms of architectural practice that can take place in the form of installations and exhibitions. 
as I was running through my sets of, uh, of images, these kinds of interesting convergences, maybe more immediate, come up. The two of these people working on the very same project. Um, this is Con Ed in New York, on the East River in New York in 1999-2000. OMA's scheme on the left, um, and Eisenman Architects project on the right. Uh, another interesting kind of example where the convergence, let's say, might work less in relation to the project type, but more in terms of the diagrams at play. An interesting kind of prehistory where an idea like the Mobius strip and the folding together of space can be seen to operate across the bodies of work in, um, in differing but connected ways. Um, I think even a project like this which both offices worked on a few years ago at IIT, OMAs. These are the two competition models for that project. Um, well, pursuing very different kinds of projects, one of the interesting things is how they both rely on a kind of regulating line that goes out from the site and connects the campus in different ways. <clears throat> or as another kind of, let's say, diagram conversion, an interesting example of this sort of a project, the, the Lavalette project in Paris, which Peter works on in the mid-80s with Jacques Derrida, a small portion of the larger scheme, um, and OMA's famous entry for that competition a couple of years earlier, which both rely in compelling ways on a kind of superimposed strategy of grids and regulating lines. Which brings us maybe as a backdrop to tonight's discussion. And the question of how we connect or disentangle projects that are very much in, I would argue, mid-career, and in fact forming the basis for bodies of work that are going to carry forward for the next 20 years. Both architects are taking time out tonight from practices that are involved with the biggest projects they've ever undertaken. Uh, Peter in New York and his project in Spain, in Santiago, in the city of culture. Rem and OMA right now working in Beijing on a project at an almost unprecedented scale for CCTV. <clears throat> and I think the, the important thing about, um, about the setting for this discussion tonight is that it's meant to be one of architectural work, of actually caring for the things that they're thinking about in their practices in a venue like this tonight. And I think of, of the two practices that we could look to today that offer a model for what a critical practice might be, it's the way in which these guys found projects in the 1970s around the two articles I've got up on the screen here, written in 76 and 77. Um, Peter's article on post-functionalism published in 1976, which disentangles a kind of conventional modern functionalism and puts it as a form of cultural practice. And a year later, the article that, that uh, Rem Koolhaas writes on the culture of congestion and the discovery in the metropolis of New York a completely different kind of space than the one that modern architects have been arguing for through the 20th century, the kind of hidden potential of the future. Um, uh, with that as a backdrop, I think the important thing to say about, about tonight's session is that we've tried to organize it around a series of topics which each of our guests tonight will respond in relation to. Um, what I've invited each to do is to make an opening statement in the next 10 minutes which can reflect upon a series of topics that we've been discussing the last couple of weeks. And with that, then, we'll return to each of those topics one by one and go through them this evening, with the idea being a kind of five-minute exchange from each side around each of these topics over the next hour or hour and 20 minutes. Um, we have thrown the coin upstairs. Um, Peter's going to be making the first presentation tonight, his opening statement. <coughs> Which will be looking at, um, which will be touching upon. Don't don't let's have the slides right now. Okay. Oh, wait. Um, which will be. Can we take them off? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> I mean, otherwise everybody's going to look at the pictures and. Okay, leave it there. Yeah, I'll no, okay. clear the screen. <laughs> <clears throat> just, to, just to say very briefly, the topics that we've set up for tonight's discussion. Um, uh, which will form the kind of framework for the conversation between the two. The, the, the first point in we thought that would be very interesting is to just talk a little bit about the question of what might constitute a critical practice today, something that each of these guys have argued from a different position um, and, in fact, evolved and developed in differing ways over the last 30 years. Um, um, following that, a second topic would be, let's call it the discipline of architecture. And let's say the relationship between that discipline and the larger world today, and the role that architecture plays in relation to that, um, which will lead into a topic um, that we've titled Form and Figure, 
and the role that those kind of terms might play in the operations that are going on in the projects. And with that then, um, a fourth topic that will look at the question of subjectivity, the kinds of audiences, the sorts of users that the work that's been developed in both offices has been addressing over the years. Um, and with that kind of idea explained a bit then, um, a more specific topic around the diagram and the relationship between diagrams, diagrammatic processes, and, uh, and programs that the projects have been dealing with. And then we'll conclude with a sixth topic that we've titled Architecture in the City and the relationship between, let's say, modern architecture and modern urbanism. We have two or three or four or five or ten other topics back there that we'll see if we can get to over the course of the evening, but the idea is that those six set up a kind of framework for these opening <coughs> statements. Um, thank you, Brett. Uh, the idea for these this evening uh, was germinated in, a, in New York City when Rem and I were on a panel, I guess, two years ago with two other architects. And it was very frustrating because neither of us felt we could say anything be out of deference to the other two architects. And when we left the room, we went and had a coffee together, remember, and I said, hey, Rem, we really ought to do this, just the two of us. And he agreed that this would be a good idea. And I said, let's do a series of three one in your hometown in Rotterdam, uh, one in my hometown of New York, and one in a neutral site in London, which I find interesting as a neutral site. But in any case, uh, I guess it's my Anglophilia that uh, causes that. In any case, <coughs> this is the first of those. Um, we almost made one in, in Holland, and uh, there's a lot of energy to try and see if this works out to do another two. In any case, um, what is so interesting about Brett's introduction is I listed six topics and uh, the six topics didn't sound like anything like the ones he was talking about. <laughs> so um, th this is how you can misread uh, from a point of view which I think is useful. Um, uh, I have as the first topic uh, architecture and ideology uh, <coughs> rather than uh, current problems. Uh, I have autonomy and engagement as the second, uh, which is certainly different from disciplinary issues. I have as the third, which is really interesting, <coughs> content and form as opposed to form and figure, uh, just so that you can see the slight variation, because I think there's a, an enormous variation between uh, content and form, which I wanted to talk about, and form and figure. The other was... Uh, I thought we were talking about subjectivity and there are different views of subjectivity. Uh, the fifth one was certainly diagram versus figure as I understood it and the sixth one uh, was something to do with modernism versus urbanism. Uh, in any case there are not many verses but I'd like to go through uh, the issues as I see them and show a few briefly to show a few images. You have to understand that there are two things that I want to put on the table. First of all, Rem and I started to talk to each other as early as 1973. Uh, I was recalling, just to make sure it was clear, evidently he and I had gone to a lecture of Richard Myers um, at Columbia in the fall of 73, uh, and Rich Richard gave one of his usual lectures, and Rem got up and, and, and was uh, made a very strong critical statement and I got up defending Richard as was always my want and said you can't do this and Rem thought that he that I was acting as a referee rather than as another uh, participant and the discussion went on uh, in, at to the Institute so that was our first uh, real discussion I think in the in the fall of 73 um, I remember one evening uh, and Rem loves to quote it when uh, I walked in chewing my cigar into his office uh, and said, Rem, your problem is you don't know anything about form, trying to imitate Rem imitating me. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, that might have been those days. I teach Rem in a um, course that I give called 10 Canonical Buildings of the Late uh, 20th Century. Um, and I think it's important to understand that uh, I think architects, like philosophers and, and literary people and 
artists should be concerned with their colleagues' work. And I'm working on an article uh, on REM uh, for AV right now. It's called REM Kula, Strategies of the Void, the Becoming Image of the Diagram. And um, it's, a, for me, important piece for me to understand where I am in relationship to the kind of thinking that REM is doing. And very rarely all you get is news speak and media in situations where there's writing. Uh, people are certainly afraid to uh, write about some architects for fear of losing their job. And um, I think it's important for architects to stand up not only for each other, but to stand up critically and talk about the issues. So I, I want to try and place that uh, into the context tonight. Um, I want to start uh, with the term architecture and ideology. Can we have the first <coughs> slide, please? And uh, I'm going to start with this slide and end with it. Um, and uh, there are two images from our Holocaust project in Berlin. And I think the two issues for me uh, that are at work in this project, uh, which I, I find the two most important current problems, is the question of the dominance of opticality in uh, the way we view and think about architecture, and the problem of the metaphysics of presence, that is, the fact that all presence, in fact, is not merely presence, but representation of presence. And so I've been working on <coughs> the problems of non-representation and the questions of weak form. And of course, I'm going to close uh, to show you how non-representational uh, this project really is. The second issue is uh, autonomy uh, versus engagement. And I, and I think that if we can have the next. Um, mm -hmm. And um, these are two <coughs> images. I purposely picked a library competition that both Zaha and I were in um, to show how uh, uh, I saw autonomy today uh, that was, in a way, non-site specific. Uh, and it was dealing with the question uh, that I call of horizontal vectors. And what you see are, uh, on the slide, can I get the, the this guy, yeah. yeah. Um, the slide on the left is an existing church and there was a former church there. And there were these two grids that were formed by one a real grid and the other a virtual grid. And we took this and with a series of horizontal vectors that you can produce on the computer, distorted the, the structure of the relationship between the two. In other words, instead of superposing them as I would have done in the past uh, as a process kind of project, we allowed them to interact in, and create an internal vortex of space, which I would argue is very different than uh, the vortex of space that um, is at Le Corbusier's Strasbourg project, and of course, which I believe uh, Rem critiques in many of his, uh, the, the Bibliothèque de France, the Je Seux, etc. Um, the third one is, uh, the third issue is uh, content and form, kind of the, the next one, uh, and that's Rem's uh, Seattle Library and the, uh, the model of our Hamburg Library. And I would argue that uh, there's no question that um, REM's library for me is uh, content as form, and I, I think that's a fair uh, statement, but I would also argue that our Humber project is form as content, and I think there's an enormous difference between those two uh, juxtapositions of those two words. One, form, uh, content as form, or form as content. Uh, the next one, please. Uh, is um, the Seattle Public Library uh, and our the, the diagram for uh, I, I'm missing one. I'm sorry. Uh, the the next issue I don't have any slides for, but in fact it talks about the different ideas of subject that I think we have, and one of the interesting ideas of subject that deals uh, with both. Um, 
the uh, project for Jesu and also the project in Seattle is the, the subject as voyeur. That is, the subject is no longer merely uh, watching passively, but in fact, uh, in a sense, participating uh, as a different kind of subject. And we have been working on a project uh, called uh, Radical Passivity, um, and which is, in a sense, a non-passive passive. I think you find it in the films, for example, today of Michael Haneke, especially in uh, Code Unknown and, and, and Caché, uh, where nothing seems to be happening and where you have to become involved in the nothing happening. And, and uh, I think that there's a certain condition of radical passivity that I think exists uh, within um, Berlin. Next. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, that, no, you go back, go back. Um, in Seattle and in, in uh, the, the, I believe that there are two types of diagrams uh, that Rem and I both use. One is the diagram as icon or as a visual similitude, uh, which I believe exists um, in Seattle. And then there is the diagram as the index, which is in uh, the diagram uh, in this project in Santiago, can I have the next one on, on uh, yeah. that? Uh, and the volumetric transformations that deal with the, the superposition of a medieval grid, a, a, a Cartesian grid, and a series of, of very different uh, grid projects that uh, superpose and produce the final indexical structure as opposed to iconic structure. Uh, again, not making a value judgment, but just saying there are two different aspects of what Charles Sanders Peirce calls a sign. Uh, the next is uh, the two Mobius strips. And of course, they are very different in intention. The one interesting thing for me about Rem's uh, Mobius, which is not in our one at, at Max Reinhardt, is that it deals, it turns the, the strong vector of a vertical building into a horizontal vector. And I think the, the horizontal vector at both the base and the top of, of CCTV is, is important. The two issues that we were at work, uh, and of course we're talking about a, a gap of, of almost uh, 12 to 15 years, uh, two issues which were at work for us were the idea of making a non phallocentric tower, uh, which was uh, an important issue back in the early 90s. And the second issue was the whole theoretical question of, of what is meant by inside and what is meant by outside. And of course, the Mobius constantly turning on itself uh, is there is no single inside or outside. There is no uh, frame between the two. So we saw it not as an icon uh, or as a symbol, but rather as an investigation into the substrate of, of architecture. And the final uh, slide I wanted to show was something that we received yesterday uh, was a poster of this new political party in, uh, in Italy um, <coughs> celebrating the day of memory, the day that Auschwitz was liberated. And what is interesting for me about it is that they felt it felt obliged and sort of proved the point about our field to, to emboss a Jewish star over the field. That is, no one would have been able to read the field without the Jewish star. And so for me, uh, that was a very significant thing that, you know, I keep saying to myself, why do they have to do that? And then I realized that was precisely the point that we forced them to superpose the Jewish star onto the field. So those are the issues that, um, for me, uh, we bring to the table. I think both of us are very capable of, of looking at these in, in many, many different ways, but that's a start. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh. <clears throat> Yeah.
My kind of presentation is a little bit uh, more personal. Um, basically, I came to architecture as a journalist, and, and journalist is, uh, of course, a, a profession without discipline. Uh, it is only a regime of curiosity uh, that is applicable to any subject. Uh, and I would say that that is still a kind of very important uh, issue uh, and, and drive in architecture. So I came to architecture, uh, a curiously uh, old subject uh, uh, of which the laws and the kind of terrain and the interest are sometimes maybe more than 4,000 years old. Uh, at the exact moment uh, where uh, the world became the subject of architecture, uh, when I really became an architect was in the 70s and would say that that was the kind of beginning uh, of globalization. And so one entry into architecture became the fact that uh, with a kind of journalistic interest, uh, it became uh, an extremely interesting effort to see what the effects of globalization uh, considered as a kind of form of journalism or global preoccupation would be and could be on architecture. Uh, architecture for me, as I said, is something where the narrative and anecdote and in many, and I know these are kind of fairly uh, obscene words in architecture, uh, sometimes dominates uh, our preoccupation, uh, as in this case, uh, our 71 study of the kind of Berlin Wall as architecture. Uh, and of course, uh, we are also interested in behavior. Uh, and here, simply an image of how the Berlin Wall uh, itself imposed a number of uh, uh, efforts, sometimes vain, sometimes successful, to escape from Berlin. What I would like to kind of simply say is that the entire range from the anecdote to the narrative to the tragedy, uh, that, that all of that is incorporated in our uh, concerns. Um, we were lucky to coincide with the beginning of globalization, uh, and, and perhaps uh, you cannot quite say the same uh, in terms of the economic effects, the economy that uh, was parallel to globalization. Uh, because uh, the, our start in architecture, if I would date it uh, with my completion of this uh, school, was 72. And ever since, we have had an increasing uh, turning away from the public sector uh, and toward the private sector. <coughs> and therefore, uh, a kind of very serious undermining of the traditional legitimacy of architecture. Uh, and I think that the effect of globalization, and we all wrestle with it, uh, and the effect of the market economy is to, to make architecture both more and less important at the same time, uh, where it currently, and uh, I think that none of us is immune to that uh, combination, uh, combines maximum ingenuity uh, that yet leaves us fundamentally undernourished. Um, now, I want to kind of basically look at how stupid architects are. Uh, uh, and, and because uh, although we provide the icons of the market economy, uh, I think that we are the only artistic discipline that doesn't benefit from the market economy. Uh, movie stars make astronomical pop stars, uh, art stars, sports stars, even script writers make uh, kind of enormous amounts of money. But the architect kind of has a kind of stubborn stubbornly horizontal line uh, with a kind of m uh, modest uh, stratosphere <laughs> of uh, 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 Foster and Gary. Uh, but, but compared to, to the other uh, incomes, uh, they are, uh, of course, laughable. And we've recently been able to see how, how Foster's office uh, also uh, has a kind of uh, problem uh, with money. Uh, so. <coughs> Uh, we have to very, and, and this is, I think, perhaps my most fundamental uh, difference with Peter. Uh, we, the di we look differently at the discipline of architecture. The discipline of architecture, of course, imposes certain disciplines on its users, but even more uh, uh, importantly, it also imposes uh, currently an incredible <coughs> discipline on the architect. And, and basically, I 
looked at, you know, if this is the entire uh, repertoire between uh, intervention and abstinence, uh, the architect is always on the side of intervention. If it's the repertoire between change and leaving as is, the architect is always on the side of change. If the uh, repertoire between execute and observe, the architect is always on the side of execution. On act and reflect, the architect is always uh, on the side of acting. Now, I don't know a single profession that would be satisfied with this combination of interfering, changing, executing and acting. And that would be happy to leave abstinence, uh, leaving, observing and reflecting kind of almost uh, on the wayside. And I think that uh, in many ways uh, our kind of recent uh, swerve uh, or kind of relationship with architecture is determined by, uh, conquer, by the de determination to conquer those inaccessible domains of this graph. Uh, now, um, and, and maybe to, to make an even more embarrassing definition of what we actually want to do, um, we are, yeah, yeah, in, in the event, uh, we are uh, intellectuals, but we are intellectuals uh, strictly inside uh, architecture. And uh, if I'm kind of really completely honest, uh, I would say that our attempts uh, recently uh, have become uh, to become uh, not an architectural intellectual, but a public intellectual. Uh, in other words, an intellectual that is able and competent to, to pronounce uh, in uh, domains also outside uh, architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, now, how to do this? We, we, of course, it is a kind of explosion of the, uh, and kind of almost cell division of the typical architectural kind of office, but I think most importantly, what the attempt is, is to look at work, not as kind of separate um, uh, projects, uh, but as the kind of potential generation of work where if you analyze in each of these the political uh, and other components, uh, there is uh, an a cumulative intelligence or cumulative effect that uh, is not necessarily knowledge about architecture, but really increasingly knowledge about the world, knowledge about the uh, discrepancies in the world. Uh, this is the f cost of Europeans to go to the world and for world citizens to go back to Europe, and it's incredible uh, discrepancy. The way we driving vintage cars from Paris to Beijing and uh, the Chinese hidden in uh, uh, trucks uh, uh, from Beijing to Europe, uh, the same the Strait of Gibraltar, for us it is a kind of race and, and of course for Africans uh, it is a very often deadly race, etc. Um, there was a matter of diagrams and the diagram is for us kind of no longer kind of really um, uh, a device that triggers architecture or that enables us uh, to trigger architecture, but it's also a device to look at the world and to try to represent some of the kind of bizarre conditions of the world. Mm. Uh, this is, uh, for me, uh, remains an important diagram where this is the rate of urbanization in Europe and North America. Here is the production of important architectural text. Uh, and of course, we all had incredible opinions uh, as we were urbanizing. But basically, we stopped thinking uh, when the cities were complete at the, the exact moment that Africa, and uh, that uh, Africa also, but uh, Asia are urbanizing at a faster speed than we ever did. So basically, this space uh, of urbanization is taking place in uh, an intellectual void as far as the West is concerned, and presumably an emerging uh, concern and emerging ideology as far as the East is concerned. We did the same with shopping, but we also are now kind of working for uh, media companies in which we used the uh, diagram not as a creative uh, element for building, but as a, uh, a way of looking at their economy and intersecting every title of Condé Nast and seeing at which intersections potentially new magazines could uh, be born and emerge. Uh, and, and in the same diagrammatic way, we, we do buildings. 
Now, when I say uh, intellect, uh, public intellectual, um, it is for me a daily uh, tragedy to see how badly Europe is doing and how incompetent it is in terms of conveying its uh, raison d'etre uh, and, and its functioning. So it's probably relatively known that we have been kind of working for them uh, utterly unsuccessfully, but uh, definitely with uh, an, an ambition to address the issue of how to represent Europe politically and how to uh, explain at the same time the grotesque history of Europe and the more or less uh, plausible uh, destiny of the European Union, all in a kind of single kind of performance. Um, that role uh, is, is now for me uh, perhaps the most important role to, to, be, to play and, and in a certain way the office is increasingly geared to uh, uh, enable us to devise the intelligence uh, and, and the production to uh, enter those territories where we're not invited. And, and perhaps that is the most critical thing uh, which for me remains uh, currently a, a total uh, impossibility of architecture. Uh, not only are we economically inept uh, because we are surfing on a horizontal curve, uh, but uh, also we are, Peter was talking about extreme pass passivity, uh, we are utterly passive in terms of the commissions that uh, come to us and basically uh, willing to kill ourselves and each other uh, in our uh, efforts to get work. Uh, it was a kind of source of incredible pride that um, the, uh, the tent we did in Brussels uh, immediately became uh, a territory and center of political action, in this case, uh, kind of Islamic uh, performance. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, it, in that sense, you know, in its grossness uh, and uh, populism is perhaps uh, interesting to compare to, to Peter's. I, I guess it's you there, Peter. In Berlin. Um, I was, um, yeah, as, as Peter was building his building in Berlin, I was looking, and, and this is you know, where perhaps politics, but also the economy converge. Uh, looking at the space for architecture uh, in uh, the uh, Chinese political system uh, and the Chinese economy. Uh, China, contrary to what people think, is not uh, on its way to a market economy, but uh, on the contrary, it, it remains a state uh, and an authoritarian state, uh, and therefore it is able to do uh, things that are completely differently. Uh, if anyone has a stomach, uh, we could uh, discuss our contribution to that state or our comment on the state. Uh, but in any case, for me, this is the uh, important part of CCTV, not its form, uh, the incredible accumulation of facilities uh, for uh, creating media and, and working in media. Subjectivity and, and audience is and this is very old-fashioned, perhaps, in our work, uh, that we are ent actually interested in people, not in a kind of humanitarian, humanist, or nice way, uh, but simply because uh, the flows and the behavior of global culture at the moment where almost all cultures not only collide, but also interact and, and influence each other is a, a subject of our passion, and therefore how to address those new conditions and to see whether we can be intelligent in those conditions with the conditions remains uh, a very important uh, issue. So therefore, for me, the audience is both the people who produce, uh, the people who use, uh, and the people who gawk, the people who enjoy uh, and, and, and the kind of final uh, triumphalist kind of image uh, such as you can only dream of it in your wildest dreams, uh, but also the kind of flatness uh, of the tourist in the internet and the kind of constant and endless dialogue. Um, maybe I'll stop here. Could I ask? 
I, I wanted to ask a question because I think it's at the heart of some of our discussion. You may say that the form of CCTV is of no con of little less concern to you than the content or the program or whatever. I doubt whether very many people uh, will 50 years from now be concerned about how well the program works. Mm -hmm. uh, sociologists might be. Uh, there are a lot of good uh, TV buildings that probably work just as well as CCTV. Uh, but I think you're being disingenuous to say that the form isn't the thing that catches everybody's attention, which they can then uh, focus on the content, how well the content comes out. Not all contents of TV stations look like CCTV. I think CCTV is a fantastic project. It's a fantastic project because it is form as content, not merely content as form. Uh, I, 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 I think I think you're right, and and basically, you know, no one uh, in his right mm -hmm. mind would spend the kind of energy on on the form that that we are spending on it, right. if they were not uh, completely obsessed with that too. But, but I give a kind of more private kind of yeah. indication of, of <laughs> our interest. I just want to kind of briefly talk about the city. Uh, the city, you know, I gave recently a lecture in Cape. You know, where I was uh, uh, creating an inventory uh, of, of the way in which the public realm, uh, simply partly driven by politics but equally driven by the market, is increasingly evacuated from danger and uh, increasingly uh, um, inane. Uh, and, and I think that this is, you know, the public realm, uh, unfortunately, 2006. And if you compare it to the public realm uh, in the 50s, then uh, there is no doubt that the last person will engage in kind of more radical adventures than than this guy who kind of perhaps at the best has a change of underwear in his suitcase. Uh, that's maybe it. Yeah, that's it. Also because of the time. Yeah. Go ahead. No. You want to? No, that's it. I'm Thanks. finished. <laughs> you see, but I think the issue, if we go back to uh, Rem's view of, of this, the world of globalization um, and how we deal with globalization, um, first of all, we both build in different countries. I don't build in the country I live in. He rarely builds in the country he lives in. So and that's one aspect of globalization. Um, but we still are, uh, even though there's globalization, both of us, at least I believe, I'm still subject to local politics in an enormous way. I mean, trying to understand what it is to deal with Galicia in Spain, which is a, an, an anomaly within the Spanish context. And globalization doesn't really, I mean, both of us were in that competition. Uh, global, uh, globalization doesn't really affect Gallegos in a certain way. They are concerned about their local culture, about speaking their local uh, language, the autonomy of, of the province. Uh, they're, they're trying to do something the reverse of, of to be part of the global economy and the global market. Um, and, you know, to understand this is a really a uh, really difficult thing for even people from Madrid or Barcelona to understand. And now we're dealing with uh, Gallego nationalists, uh, the bloque, who are uh, a very different group of people. And to understand their culture is no different than to try and understand a, a, a culture, an autonomous culture, 50 years or 100 years ago to understand the Russian Revolution. To understand the nationalist revolution that's occurring in Galicia has very little to do with my competence as an architect, okay? And, um, and maybe that is what Rem is saying, that I'm looking at it too uh, microscopically, competence as an architect. And I, and I might agree with him, but I am not a political commentator, and I, when I run into political realms, I've, I find myself you know, ineffective, right? Um, and so I'm not certain that we can be global citizens in the, in the true sense of the word because whether I don't, I don't believe our training leads us in that way. 
and that what we do is confront local situations which ultimately confront architecture. I mean, these people want to know what does a project do for a nationalist spirit, okay? And th that's a really interesting question, and how, do, how, how does one argue that? I imagine the same thing occurred when we were doing work in Taiwan. You know, how can this project help us to stand against mainland China, okay? We're, we're doing a project in Jakarta now. Um, there are some really tricky political issues in, in Jakarta, so I don't pretend to understand them. Uh, <coughs> and uh, I think that what one is trying to do and where I think that we do have, we look at things in a different way, I think that CCTV is a spectacular building, all right? And I'm not sure that the cult of the spec, in other words, where do we go after, where, where, where does REM go, and this is rhetorical, I don't mean to, but it is such a spectacular building that how does one do a skyscraper after it? In other words, has it not pushed the limit uh, of the vertical building? That's what I'm interested in. The reason why I'm interested in CCTV and why I think it's incredible for the horizontal connections that operate as dynamically important in, in the vertical building is I think it will set the tone for high-rise buildings for the years to come. Mm -hmm. The question is, does something always have to be spectacular to change the model or the type? And, that, and that's, mm -hmm. that's a, for me, an issue that must be on the table uh, when we talk about these globalization, CCTV, et cetera, right? Would, would one do CCTV, let's say, in, um, Istanbul, I think one could. I mean, I don't think it's because it's in China that, you know, one wouldn't, w could or could not do it. Yeah, well, I, I think the, the thing is uh, not so much to, to become uh, global citizens, and, and it's also not at all uh, a kind of sense that the, uh, the outbreak of a kind of global family or global f uh, community is imminent. But I think that um, it is very clear that the only thing that we pretend to to want to become or to need to become is more kind of global experts because I think that is exactly where the question would you do a CCTV in, in, in Turkey uh, is really an, a question that if you know the exact moment where culture is currently where Turkey is currently poised you know its economy and you know you know a number of factors also, if you know it's kind of regional associations, then it is 100% sure that no one in Turkey would, would ever ask for it. Uh, and that there is simply no political economic space in Turkey to do a building like that. And, and so it's, for me, very important that we don't go in almost uh, unprepared and, and, and addressing almost any situation we, we find, but more to be slightly active uh, in terms of our own agenda. And I think that maybe later we can discuss this issue of passivity, uh, where kind of rather than, uh, uh, I mean, I'm not, it, it's maybe irrelevant, but CCTV was also not World Trade Center. You know, it was a deliberate decision to participate in uh, a, a particular competition and not in another one because uh, not only conviction but also you know simple calculation uh, that we could do something there that at that point we wanted to do. I, th I think when we set the, uh, the this first topic and the, the question of um, and I'm not sure we got the wording right critical practices the idea of a mm -hmm. critical practice today in thinking and work the work being something that includes both the text you guys produce but also the building certainly in <coughs> um, what yeah. you, you, Peter, were describing more in terms of architecture and ideology, would we then, in, in the, the, the conversation to settle on this immediately, maybe one way to try and understand a critical practice is to say that each of you, in your own way, have argued for situating the work in relation to something, mm -hmm. to ideas, right. let's say to ideas, to the history of the discipline, to the realities of the urban world, the metropolitan mm -hmm. life, mm -hmm. something that then the work is situated in relation to. Now, the, the question I imagine opening with would be, as, as that project is evolved, do, do those differing positions 20, 30 years ago, for example, start to converge on a condition like globalization as the dominant issue is situated in, or does it in fact still stay in the background in relation to other ideas that you might be? 
Well, let's, I'm going to follow it with the last thing Ram said. We didn't go into New York because we couldn't do what we wanted to do. Um, and of course, one really needs to examine what that means. I don't want to do that, but uh, we went into New York because we were citizens of New York and felt an obligation to do it, even though we knew we couldn't do what we wanted to do. So that's number mm. one. Number two, when I spoke with the mayor of Istanbul and we had a long conversation, uh, I said, you know, <laughs> what would really be important? Because one thing that the, the, the Muslim street, let's say, and I don't want to speak for the Muslim street, for God's sake. I mean, I, you know, the world is going to come down on me. But in any case, I said, you know, you guys are going after the 2010 um, uh, Euro Cup or what, what, whatever one they were going after. Uh, and I said, why not do a series of stadia? I happen to be interested in doing stadia, and I think the one place where politics and sport and national characteristics engage each other is in the stadium. And I would have thought that if, if the mayor had said, we'll bring Rem in and Herzog and others to do a series of stadia, that would capture the imagination of the street in, in such a way that they became political artifacts. This would be a useful occupation. In other words, and uh, the mayor was very interested in this. And in fact, they may be going ahead with having uh, various architects come in and do stadiums for, that's what I mean by understand, for me, understanding the local situation. Now, I happen to also, yes, but I like to do a stadium, yes. But the stadium I would do <coughs> in Istanbul would not be like the stadium we did in Munich or the one we're doing in Arizona. And I agree with Rem, you wouldn't do CCTV at the World Trade Center site. But I what I would propose for a kind of Spartan and tough country like uh, Turkey, where they're not spoiled with uh, optical uh, overdose, uh, <laughs> to do the same stadium everywhere. To what? I didn't hear. To do the same stadium everywhere. Provided you had the competition, but no, suppose no, I won the competition, no. I said, Rem, yours no, is No, but I mean, just like just mine. as a just as a way of ending ending this. Horrible kind of production of difference uh, gratuitously simply mm. because you're an architect. But we don't we both uh, and, and, and so. But don't we both in, in, engage in in? I mean, it's it hasn't media forced us to constantly today produce difference. In other words, that media wants something new all yes. the time, and if you want to stay hot in the media, and media is <clears> the way we get work, we're constantly forced into difference, aren't we? You and I are no different in that sense. No, but uh, and, it, and it's uh, it's about kind about of really not about our difference. But I think that uh, mm. nevertheless, there are ways uh, to outwit media uh, and to uh, assume kind of responsibilities where no one asks you to. Mm. I think uh, there uh, are. Uh, yeah, but that's uh, uh, called, uh, could be so, called passivity. Uh, uh, huh? No, I think that that is kind of not passivity. That that is. I mean, I, I, it, it's. It, it's it's really stunning uh, if you look back, uh, for instance, in the past decade, kind of at which moments architects really could have kind of associated together or kind of made gestures together or said no together mm -hmm. in, in, in some of the more important uh, uh, projects. And I, I've really tried extremely hard, but I've never, ever convinced a single architect in the world to join me in an effort to refuse something which was imposed on this and which was kind of absolutely absurd and not met a single architect who didn't actually gratefully think that okay that's one less uh, competitor <laughs> uh, and, and, and we are definitely going to try uh, to to win this uh, thing well you know I remember calling you and asking you what you felt about Madrid I should just tell the story of Madrid it's huh? really amazing huh? because you made the right move, I made the wrong move, and you said, for whatever reason, you weren't going to go in the Manzanares River competition, I should tell you. And this is where uh, architects run afoul of, of the political process. Uh, Jacques Herzog, uh, Juan Navarro, Sejima, and ourselves all entered this competition that was set up as a high rollers competition, and they had various judges from around the world there. And I remember we presented, and um, at the end of the presentation, the 
mayor, who was not supposed to be in the jury, got up and said, okay, before we begin the judgment, uh, Herzog's project's out, Sejima's project's out, Navarro's project's out, Eisenman's project's out. We can't consider those projects. They're not right for Madrid, Bing. And of course, Rem was very lucky because he didn't put one in. But it, the same thing would have happened. And so a sort of modest uh, Spanish project was the winner. And we spent a lot of time and energy doing a project that had we know what the terms were going to be, Rem would have been right, that we should have refused to go in. Yeah, or, or uh, kind of at this phase of globalization, uh, you should, one could kind of really encourage more Spanish projects in Spain. I, I mean, do you the, believe that? Uh, yes, I, I really believe that. Uh, well, I mean, you, kind of mean, you, mean you mean bound to Holland? <laughs> that's that's not the same kind of. Well, no, I'm, curious, really, no, no, honestly, I'm kind of you know the, you lucky to be a citizen Spanish? of a country with a very small footprint. So, yeah. our, 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 <laughs> so our, our our expansion is uh, kind of inevitable and, and 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 doesn't really weigh down on the global situation. But I think yes, we really have to consider that that kind of at certain points, you know, our participation is mm. patently absurd. But, but I think in the way you guys are talking about globalization, I think one of the things we could say tonight is you are both also absolute experts at globalization and a much more immediate relation to architecture. And Peter, you hinted at it, that, that you do, do both work globally. Yeah. And I think and Peter is, uh, given the fact that he realized the, the monument in uh, <coughs> Berlin, uh, mm. and mm. a very impressive politician. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have to tell you, if, if there's no question that that political decisions are, are, are part of the world. And the reason why Rem says that, when we started our project, we, we started with the uh, CDU, with Helmut Kohl was behind the project. The Schroeder government got in be as one of the ways of getting in was against this project. Uh, and the social minister, the culture minister, Michael Nauman was the sort of leader of, of the fight against that project. And that project, when coal was lost, was dead. I mean, there was no way that that project was going to begin again. And um, it wasn't. Um, yeah, I wrote the, in junk space, uh, right. only the dead can be resurrected. Yeah, only the dead so. can we, 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 we It's a kind of typical <laughs> modern condition. Yeah, but, but Rem, let, <laughs> let, let's go back. I think that, for example, we have consciously avoided going to China. I have consciously avoided it because honestly, I'm not convinced that my knowledge, I understand the culture well enough to be able to do a building that would be appropriate as opposed to doing it at the World Trade Center uh, in China. In other words, I wouldn't be able to make that distinction. And I'm interested how you make that distinction that you could say we could not. We could do something in China, the CCTV competition, that we couldn't do at the World Trade Center. How would you have known that? I mean, how do you think one knows that? Because I couldn't have made that judgment. Well, I, I, th I think that we we simply equipped the office with a, with a kind of apparatus to make that kind of judgment, or we tried to do that. I mean, I hate to to to, to seem kind of too smooth, but uh, it, it was kind of actually through a laborious uh, engagement with China 10 years before we actually had to take the decision mm -hmm. uh, as part of Harvard to, to actually really explore. And, and that is what I find so kind of really sad about b the profession that you know, we can create unbelievable ingenuity inside it, but uh, outside it mm. we, we, we have uh, such a dearth of, of information and such a tenuous relationship with with information that um, those pertinent judgments uh, are, are becoming almost uh, <coughs> impossible. I mean, kind of like lemmings, you know, kind of go in one direction and then another well, let's, direction. Let's ask a question. Yeah, and let's ask a question. You and I both teach, and <coughs> we both teach an increasing number of <coughs> students from other cultures. And yet, I would not say if I sent a student from another culture to, to study with Rem Kulnas, that I would send he, him or her to study with Rem 
to understand about uh, African culture, Chinese culture, and how it affected architecture. I want them to study with Rem because of how he deals with architecture, how he faces a problem, whether it's Lagos, whether it's Beijing, mm -hmm. wherever, how he faces an architectural project, right? So therefore, there must be a universal knowledge uh, that you and others possess. In other words, because we're not telling you to change your, your way of teaching, we're saying we want you to be more like Rem Koolhaas. That's the reason to go to your office. That's the reason to study with you. So if that's the case, then there is no specific condition in China that would warrant you to change what you were doing. In fact, it wouldn't at all. That, that it could be China, it could be Lagos, etc. That globalization does not mean that you change yourself at all, but in fact adapt in a certain way. But you don't teach any differently to East Asian students as you do to Middle Eastern students as you do to American students. You, you teach REM. So, uh, well, uh, sorry. No, maybe you don't. Uh, well, uh, uh, it's, it's a really an inter interesting subject because I, uh, 10 years ago, became uh, a teacher at Harvard on condition that I didn't have to have any involvement with design. Uh, that was with one particular dean, and that I would do research because I uh, uh, proclaimed myself as ignorant of many situations, and all I offered is to undo that ignorance uh, uh, with other students, wherever they came from. Uh, and, and sometimes we, we s selected them specifically to, to help uh, in that effort. Currently, there is a new dean, and, and this kind of relationship with the school and, and with a kind of uh, a professorship based on research is actually becoming really controversial. And I have a kind of extremely hard time to convince the school that it's worth the school, uh, the dean that it's worth it. But you're and, and so, therefore, it is kind of simple further evidence of the incredible kind of resistance. Uh, of, of architecture to, to reinvent the discipline uh, and, and, and the incredible you know, uh, consistency of its, you know, no matter how many apparent manifestations there are of it, the, this sharing of a single platform of what it is about uh, is, is staggering. But wouldn't you also say, Ram, that to say that you don't want to teach design, you want to do research, is a strategy of design? It yes, uh, to some extent. It is, uh, yeah. And, and the thing is, since we But I mean, that modest kind of widening is... Yeah. Well, I think, I would, uh, I would have thought that we both agree that teaching studios is a waste of time, all right? Now, they, now uh, maybe we don't. I, I think teaching... You've been doing it longer. Yeah, I, I've been wasting a lot of time. Uh, but I mean, the thing is, what I can't believe is how students still believe that having a studio and going out and running around finding out what a library is like, right? Uh, is going to help them do what REM had done in Seattle. I don't think you have to do a hell of a lot of research to be able to do Seattle. You have to have some intuition about the possibilities inherent in a site and in a program to produce say, Seattle, all right? And I think that's the genius, and the thing is you can't teach that. And so therefore, why bother doing studios? <laughs> But I think in, in this context, because you both have, have taught many studios, and as we put in our biography, taught many, many students in different places, yeah. say, say something each about how you have structured the relationship, let's say, between the office and the teaching. Peter, you've been teaching probably longer in studios in North America than any other teacher we could imagine. Right? I mean, what, four decades? <laughs> four decades straight of studios with students, uh, teaching architecture. Yeah, a lot of people, a lot of REM critics would love to have heard that remark, uh, I don't teach design, uh, or I don't want to teach design. Uh, they would have loved to have heard that. A lot of my critics would say when you say, you've been probably teaching longer than anybody else in North America, uh, it's time to stop. Uh, <laughs> so uh, um, I, I would argue this way. I have been trying to move from studio-based design projects to going to doing research, all right? And uh, unfortunately, everybody hmm. wants to design. In other words, that's all they want to do. They don't want to do research uh, on design. They want to design, right? And so ultimately, the studio goes back to that problem. Now, either you get out of doing studios and you teach 
seminars or whatever. I mean, I think it's more important that I teach my students about Rem Koolhaas' uh, uh, movement from uh, the, the Bibliothèque de France, Je Sur, Seattle, and Porto, which are the four buildings I use as an evolutionary process. I think they learn more about design than trying to design a library. And um, so you don't send them to REM anymore. You, they do that with you. No, no, I send them to REM. I mean, no, no. I mean, I, I have a whole history of students that have gone to REM and vice versa. But I think it's more important to learn about the trajectories of. I mean, REM said, let's talk about current issues today. One of the issues is what you know. If newness has been a strategy cultivated by the media, how does one stand against it? All right. I introduced the notion of radical passivity, okay? Now, what does that mean in terms of, of media, all right? And I think, I don't know, you know the films of Michael Haneke, Rem. I mean, I would have thought that his films are a, 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 an attempt to stand against the consumption of, of Hollywood mediated <coughs> stars uh, that create a passivity in the audience, okay? And, um, and I think it's important. I think he is one of the, the, the really new filmmakers. I mean, he's not New Wave, he's not Bresson, he's not Godard, he's not Antonioni. Uh, what I'm, with a question I would say is, if Michael Haneke can do this in film, what would be the extrapolation in architecture? In other words, what would it be to do such a thing in architecture? And I haven't got the answer yet, but I would have thought researching that as a, st as a project could be a project that both Rem and I would be interested in. I, I think that the word neutrality uh, is, is perhaps a kind of interesting word to, to think about these days again, you know, after all the excess. Mm -hmm. and, and, and maybe that, that is kind of similar to the... And, and you know, we, we are trying to do a number of neutral projects <laughs> that, that, that uh, I cannot kind of for really neutral shy. users, uh, neutral, no, no, neutral, for, neutral no, no. CCTV. <laughs> no, far from neutral uh, users, but yeah. and and in any case, there is always a kind of neutrality in in, yeah. in the project itself. But I think no? you see, I would have argued that we could agree that you're trying to do neutral projects. I'm trying to do neutral projects, of course. Uh, Bob Sommel would, would do that, his f famous thing, which he'll probably do on Wednesday night, yeah. about, we'll see. about Peter Eisenman yeah. and, and Rem doing neutral pro But I would have thought, <laughs> Rem, if you go back to Jesu, let's say, or you go to the Dutch Embassy in Berlin, <coughs> or you go to some of those projects <coughs> where you could argue they are not spectacular in their being, but only in the way they organize <coughs> space, time, people, function, etc. <coughs> I think I teach Jesu because I think it's a canonical building precisely because it's a critique of the spectacular, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, I would have thought, for example, uh, if you were to compare, which I like doing, your building in, in Seattle with Frank's building in Bilbao, I think Frank's building in Bilbao is a spectacular building because it's intended to structure views of the city in a way which creates a passive spectator, like Bernini. I mean, Bernini set up cinegraphic <coughs> views, and Frank's whole building is about the scenography of, of Bilbao. Your Seattle has nothing to do with scenography. So I would argue, for example, everybody says Frank is Borromini when they use those uh, terms. I think Rem's building in, in Seattle is much more interesting because it is more like Ber Borromini and Frank Bernini, if we were to take that uh, d d difference. And I think understanding the difference between the scenographic nature of Bilbao and the internal, uh, what I would consider didactic internal nature of Seattle is really important. And I think, I think it's important for students to understand what that is. And in that sense, Seattle is far more of a neutral building, you may not agree with me, than Bilbao. No, 
no, no, I mean, well, I mean, no, do you, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, um, you wouldn't put it that way. <coughs> no, no, but I mean, it's an excellent uh, argument. But could I? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got a star. In the, uh, <laughs> no, you. No, but uh, I don't want a star. I mean, it's yeah, just yeah. A no, no, I wasn't trying to give you a star. I was trying to make an, a yeah. point, which yeah. I think is useful yeah. for understanding how can we move toward. A, a more well, I think that you have been exceptionally generous in investing time in other architects and, and also in, in maintaining an architectural discussion. Hmm. Yeah, but I'm I, not I, trying I, to be and, and that, to, that, I learn. And that, that is uh, an amazing, uh, not a sideline, but uh, an additional gift uh, that you have that seems to be completely independent of your work. <laughs> <laughs> the, this is, we're on the topic of subjectivity in audience. Mm -hmm. the, the people that, that either are a part of the making of these projects or that inhabit them that are sometimes sadly called users yeah. in buildings. Um, I mean, one way to characterize it would be to say that in, in Peter's arguing for an optical thinking individual. No, I'm, uh, no, I'm within, against within, opticality. Okay, against uh, straight opticality, yes. Yeah, against straight opticality, yeah. that is a spectacular. <clears throat> but a person who experiences through the confrontation with the space, with the yeah, object, and, and that, thinks. And that, has, is forced to, no, no, necessarily no longer read. The difference I'm talking about is in, in the process projects that I was doing in the indexical projects, a person had to read, had yeah. to know the codes. What no I'm interested in now is illegibility, as in, for example, uh, code unknown, uh, yeah. uh, or in in uh, cache, where you get done and you say, well, who was sending those films? And the filmmaker doesn't care if you know that or not. And I think that is a movement toward a non-legible, by the way, um, non-spectacular way of dealing with with function, with meaning, etc. It is not necessarily to know that the new spectator, because all if you're just giving him information, he's sitting back like this, you know, or he's figuring it out, then he sits back and he feels good. Mm. But if it's not about figuring it out, if it's about having a prima facie experience with illegibility, that is creating what I would consider a non-passive passive spectator. In other words, it's not active, but it's what Blanchot would call non-passive passive. And I think that's where I'm headed. And when Rem says neutral, I think I understand what he means because I think that may be where he's headed because you can't keep going beyond, you know, can't keep getting more and more <coughs> crazy, right? And there's enough examples of mm -hmm craziness out there. But let, let's say if, if your agency, the, the kind of subject you're describing is certainly thinking in the confrontation, the, there's still an engagement. Re, the, the work of OMA, let's say the agency is undoubtedly, whether thinking or not, mobile. And the kind of the projects that run for 15 or 20 years that look at surfaces that are allowing mm -hmm. bodies to move through space in continuous, varying degrees of continuity, there is an agency still in that kind of a subject. It's, let's say different than the a one mobile, that's simply but, thinking. But the yeah. idea of a kind of active or no, mobile. No, I think that's certainly active in Rem's work. It's different than my the the idea of the event, yeah. of the voyeur. We've always been the, the the eroticism has always been part of his work. There's the kind of section where you look through and, and down. Uh, I would agree. Um, that that's a, a big difference in our work. Can, can I say what my yeah. dilemma is in these uh, discussions? Um, I, I basically gave a presentation where I, you know, politely said that, you know, I live with half my body and or half my brain, perhaps the rear part, uh, <laughs> in the world of architecture. But I also announced a very aggressive effort, perhaps with the front part, uh, to to not so much escape it because it remains a kind of very fundamental uh, part of our work, but to to engage these other uh, terrains. It's not that I want to particularly talk about them, but uh, at, at the same time, it, it remains not so much bizarre, but, but yeah. a, a given yeah. that, this, that, that this other half is always the subject and, yeah. and not, yeah. not the, the escape uh, but effort. No, but it's so, uh, being pulled uh, back uh, in. Mm -hmm. to yeah. But it's important. Right? And I think that, uh, that I would you like and to I have this discussion. I, I would like to talk to to your uh, other walls, 
perhaps you know because uh, mm. uh, there, there is you've done you know you've had a, a conference that lasted for 10 years you you've been a publisher of many magazines you've had a kind of institute that created a kind of public debate uh, um, uh, in in New York, I think that you know, in in kind of fairly tough times, you've maintained credibility of uh, difficult of difficulty, uh, uh, and I think that you know that part of you is perhaps also as an inspiration uh, a very important uh, sector, and and I I would like to talk ask you simply to talk <coughs> about that. Uh, effort and, and, and what your current position is vis-a-vis -vis that effort. I mean, whether you have something else or whether you feel you've given enough. Uh, and yeah, I think and, and, and why, you know, from somebody yeah. who certainly in the 70s could be incredibly public about anything almost, and, and uh, you've become kind of from public intellectual, a kind of really intellectual architect. I, w I would argue uh, uh, that uh, not many people tell you uh, how to get old, um, by the way, I mean, you, you, sorry, I know I mean, what you let mean. me, let me, let me, uh, I'm over 70, and you cannot behave, even though I would like to, at 70 as I did at 40. I cannot be an enfant terrible, I, you know, you, you just cannot go through life this way. Um, for example, um, I love the luxury of teaching it at Yale at one moment at Princeton and, and this year I woke up and I said hey I'm not getting any of the insurances and all of those kinds to do this kind of teaching I said I can't I gotta stop I like not being pinned down so I've decided to join an institution like you did um, on you know one day a week basis but uh, it takes care of the, the the dumb things about getting old so the second thing about getting old, so you have to look out for your family uh, and, and your exi the existence after you're here. The second thing about getting old is you don't feel old uh, and you want to keep working, right? So what does one do at 73 to keep becoming, stay vital within oneself, one's own discipline? And I would argue that the reason that you and I are at this table again is that we represent a certain level of vitality unto ourselves. In other words, you are true unto yourself, I am to myself. The question is, what, is one, what does that mean when one's 74 or 75, it's to me? And Rem, that's a nice question. Maybe the next time we, we get together, I can have an answer for how I feel about, you know, do I want to keep teaching? I'm really not so much interested in teaching anymore. I'm interested in having students do w work with me, right? And my office, by the way, very similar to REM Studios at Harvard, uh, I think it's a great model. I run my office practically as a research institution. Uh, and I think it's probably more important for a student to work in my office than it is to, to work in a studio with me. Um, and I think that one has limited amount of energy. And if you said to me, if Rem says, so what are you going to focus? I ain't going to start another magazine. I ain't going to start another institution. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, I'm trying to cut down on these kinds of uh, performative acts because, you know, I spent a lot of time getting ready. Uh, and then, you know, what do you have when you're done? Another. We don't, either of us need another book, right? Uh, I guess the, the urge is, I want to still build, right? I wanted to build a tall building. Uh, we're building these tall buildings in Jakarta, 50-story buildings. I find that uh, a real challenge to do, right? Um, there's several models of tall buildings that I'd like to build and see, see what they're like. Do I want to do another museum? No. Do I want to do another stadium? Maybe. Uh, um, I would love to do a prison, for example. You know, I'd like to do, you know, the project that Rem started out with. Uh, I, I would love to do a prison. I think a prison would be a stunning project. I would love to do a housing, pro a real housing project. And I think the one thing that I really admire about REM, and we haven't talked about it tonight, is, and one of the big differences 
I think REM, and I'm sorry to talk about you in the third person, but uh, I think REM has an urban strategy. In other words, I really like the one when I worked with Io about you know the, the project in Lag Lagos, and he talked about these tears in the fabric and the notion. <laughs> coming out of Unger's is Green Archipelago and things, and I think Unger's, by the way, is one of the people that has been overlooked in the world, and I think Rem uh, had a lot to do with propelling some of those urban ideas that, that Unger's was working on. I think that if I were to say the most important thing to me about where I want to go, I want to find out, is there an urban project? Is there something that relates architecture to <coughs> urbanity? I don't have a, a, a cadre of those kinds of projects. I think Rem's La Valette project was a stunner. Uh, I think Melon Sana was a stunning project. Uh, I think some of those Green Archipelago projects were stunning projects. And if I were to say where his career has worked for me in, a, in an important way is to talk about post modern urbanism. In other words, what are some alternative postmodern urban strategies? That's where I would like to go and to see is what would it be to do a housing project? <laughs> What's so interesting about Rem having worked on the archipelago and how these ideas get sifted down into every day. The New York Times last week had an idea about new suburban development. We no longer are into the urban or suburban sprawl, we're into the suburban archipelago. And I was immediately <coughs> brought back to Rem and Unger's project for the Green Archipelago. And there's that whole idea of now they're thinking about suburbs with holes in them, let's say. Um, and I would love to try that. You know, but, I uh, but I would say that uh, well, I'd say the, uh, the, the vast majority of those projects are, are not really projects, but are readings and interpretations of the existing. And, and I think that that constant journalistic interest uh, is, is kind of really what drives. And I think that, as I was saying, journalism is not a discipline and architecture is a discipline. This kind of alternation between uh, and investing <coughs> in looking kind of rather than doing uh, it remains Green Archipelago, uh, and you say it was not a project? I mean, I'm just curious. Yeah, but it was basically looking. It was basically looking at Berlin and seeing that there were kind of vast areas that were unoccupied and mm -hmm. thinking it's beautiful, so let's propose that as a, as a model. Mm -hmm. Would you say, that, let's jump forward now 40 years to today, and if your next urban project, would you say that that still holds as a model? Let's say you were... Uh, it, it entirely depends. <coughs> Uh, I'm doing on a kind of uh, other situation that uh, Zara is also familiar with. Uh, something in the middle, <laughs> in the very center of a <coughs> thing which has to be very central and very architectural and very deliberate. So. I, I don't know what that is. Is there, is, is there also uh, at some point the public? Yes, that yes. We, have we, have, we have a room full of people, yes. Yeah, we have a room full maybe, of people. Maybe um, to, to wrap this part of it up then before we pass to the audience, just, Rem, you just brought up the, the question of journalism, your interest in journalism again, and an approach <laughs> that's, that's investigating and discovering things in the world. Journalism would be one way into writing, I mean, in quite a literal sense, in the role that writing plays. And reading. Writing, reading, language, generally. <laughs> that, that sphere, and let's say not just language, but the use of language in each of your projects is one way to try and compare and differentiate. One of the interesting things is the language in, in the very literal sense, books, articles, careers founded out of documents like that that then lead to these projects you guys mm -hmm. have been talking about for the last half hour. Um, as that's evolved over the years, what do you think... Peter, you seem to be withdrawing away from the writing more. You're saying to focus on the building. You want to do no, a prison. No, no, I wouldn't argue. No, 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 I wouldn't. Oh, let's make sure that we get it. I was taking from Rem a clue. I would say that if you look back 50 years from today and compare Rem and myself, the, the interesting comparison will be in the books. In other words, uh, uh, Luis Galliano and, and Pierre Vittorio Aurelio have already compared content to my Tarani book, 
by the way. Yeah. Um, uh, I think Delirious New York will be compared to the PhD thesis I did in 63, which has just been published in German and now being published in English. I'm publishing my SMLXL as a thing called Eisen Manual. I think if you compared the books that he's done and the books that I've done, uh, you will see an, an enormous relationship but also difference. And I think much clearer than in our buildings. And I know that it's important for Rem to have done SMLXL. I know it's important for him to have done, done Delirious New York. Um, and my books, to me, are equally as important. And of course, as I've always said, uh, we wouldn't look at those damn buildings of Palladio had he not done the Quattro Libri. And I doubt we would have looked at those damn white houses of Corbu, because there were a lot of guys <laughs> doing them, if he hadn't done the Earth Complete, uh, in other words. And so Rem and I learned from some masters, right? And there's no question that books, if you, if you understand, uh, the history of the world were very important to those architects who we think are important. I don't know if you don't agree with that. <laughs> yeah, yes, uh, of course I agree. Uh, but, but at he the same time, no, no, I, I don't have to agree, but not at all. But uh, actually, it's a, a relief. But um, mm -hmm. uh, but I think that there again. Um, you cannot kind of simply talk about books and kind of similarity between you or me or whoever uh, between Le Corbusier and, and, and uh, Palladio. Uh, I think because something has happened uh, and something quite drastic has happened in the uh, past 30 years uh, with reading, with pub publishing, mm. with uh, the status of books and, and so therefore um, without an acknowledgement uh, of, of the drastic difference that they now occupy, uh, uh, it, it's, it, I find it a difficult discussion. Well, the and, and, and in, in a way, in, in a way th that was the pleasure of doing content hmm. to, uh, to, to do a book that was as abject uh, as, as many of current uh, conditions uh, and, and yet not become victimized by, by that. But I would have thought, uh, Rem, let, uh, let me just say one last point because we're, 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 we, we came to this table out of a mutual respect which we don't have to repeat, number one. We disagree about lots of things. But it was on the basis of seeing your, show, your content show uh, in Berlin that I chose in a certain way to do my show at the mock in Vienna, mm -hmm. right? And there can't be two more didactically opposite versions of how two people want to present mm -hmm. themselves in public, in a, in, a, in a public milieu, than content and <coughs> Mac, okay? And I'm not saying one was better than the other, but what makes it difficult to sit at this table and talk <coughs> about architecture is that whether Rem thinks of himself as, as a journalist and I think of myself as a sportscaster, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, or whatever, an athletic director, Here's you know, the, who, who knows. But I mean, there to me is a, a, a radical differentiation. I would say, and I, and I want to conclude by this uh, from my Marx and here, um, the enormous difference for me between Corbu and Mies is that Corbu had a didactic diagrammatic model, that is the Maison Domino, which set up the rest of his practice, and you could say a second didactic model, uh, which was the Citroën House. And uh, that didactic model influenced the world from 14 to 39. I believe that Rem's uh, analysis of the New York Athletic Club, the fact that he could argue that contiguity <coughs> of space was no longer a functional necessity, that is, because of the elevator, we no longer needed to have contiguous relationships that were functional. We could have, and then to tip it down into La Villette and to show that you can striate space in some way and not have it functional 
it was an important and will be considered to be an important diagram. And why REM's uh, model, I think, is so important, it didn't deal with just architecture, it dealt with the city. And I think that I have yet to propose in my work that kind of a didactic model. And I think that's what I'm still, keeps propelling me at 73. I think it's important to have such a model. And um, I'm excited about the fact that I have still one to go and he's already done his. So, I mean, you know, it's a question of whether you're climbing the hill or going down the other side. And uh, uh, so, <laughs> I like to think I'm still going up the hill because I'm still waiting well, to find Well, it seems mine. the hill is only base camp. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, any questions? Okay, let's open it up here. Um, have we got a microphone? Yeah, in the audience. Uh, questions? <laughs> Sleep. Well, oh, there's the, there's the one. Okay. Jankster. Jankster. Uh, Rem, uh, I, yeah. it's working? Yeah. yeah. Um, I liked your diagram about what architects do on the left side <coughs> and what they don't do on the right side. But, and I understand that you want to go from the left to the right and back. I mean, you want to, you want <laughs> to go to the right, right? right? Yeah. But it, curiously, you know, you did say at one point, and it's only an interesting contradiction, that we must be more active. And you said that that's what architects are always saying. So all I do is observe that this whole evening is an interesting discussion in a kind of wonderful spiral. And thank heavens that it's a conversation. And thank heavens, Brett, you framed it the way it is because of these contradictions. If you wanted to harp on them, you could be scoring points. And there was no, no attempt to score points, which is what I think, actually, used to mm. in the AA used to have conversazione. Do you believe yeah. it? The nineteenth century phrase. Uh, I was always said so, uh, scoring points when you were well. So, <laughs> so, well, well, Rem scores points off him. But uh, there's one thing that I find you both sort of trying to be more uh, like each other than the other one, and trying to uh, a kind of disappear in in a um, in a radical passivity put it that way, or neutrality. I love this. I'm more neutral than you're passive. After you, Alphonse. And I find this really strange, you know, as if you couldn't be passive enough, or actively passive, or radically <laughs> actively <laughs> passive. Uh, you know, I in a way, why try so hard to be indexical? But the indexical sign, as we know in the art world, is very big. People, don't, people want to not interfere with ecology, want to step lightly on the earth want to take a walk in nature and not leave any trace except just enough to photograph and reproduce. Mm. In a funny way, you're both saying that you don't want to be spectacular and yet by accident, that is always a, <coughs> a subtext, it is spectacular. And you're even proposing how you do it. As Corp said, it's the organizational invention in the flower. Grasp the organization, leave you know, the, the, the ornament of the flower. And I think you both have that organizational invention. But I ask you, because you're both, <coughs> in a funny way, going towards representation, which is hidden, or not too apparent. You are. You're illegible. Or, or legible. Illegible. Well, come on, Peter. You, you, <laughs> you want people on a certain level to always know that it's uh, the Holocaust. It's, that's why your field which you call the field to get lost, and everybody in the world already puts the star on it. You don't need them. You don't need well, the, the advertisers. The same way. To do it. That was the, what was but, but what is their policy for? It's for a new. Uh, because it, it's a very left. ominous image on the mm. on the poster. Mm. It is. I mean, I think uh, it's an incredible. Yeah. I just. I yeah. didn't do it. No, no. But I mean, what is the mean? What is it? What is the <laughs> what is the meaning on the poster? It is the, it the is poster. The, it is the breakup. Of the of the Socialist Party to a right and a left, and this is the left uh, side. This was the uh, the party. This has appeared all over Rome this past week in the honor of the Day of Memory, which is the freeing of Auschwitz by the Russians. Of course, we don't celebrate it in America because we didn't liberate Auschwitz; the Russians did, right? And so this is a left wing party talking about the liberation of Auschwitz and then associating it with this memorial. They took the picture, which is a very graphic image, 
but then they realized who's going to understand what the hell that is, so they put a, a, a star yeah. of David over it, right? And of course, what I realized was this is the success of the project because unless you put a star of David on it, nobody will know what the hell it is. Except it's had the most m media that any recent, you know, <laughs> iconic, non-icon has had, indexical. So I, I, you can't get away from all the things that have added the star, including the star. And all I'm asking you both, why do you try so much to deny the very spec spectacle that you do so much <laughs> to create inadvertently? You better ask him that first. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I think that ne neither one of us is, is denying, but it, it's uh. very obvious that it's a kind of uh, incredibly difficult uh, situation because there's a conflict between the extent to which it is imp imposing you uh, by expectation and, uh, and, 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 and almost politically, and the extent to which, of course, you yourself uh, want to be spectacular, but not always um, in terms of form, but sometimes in terms of simple organization or sometimes spectacular in restraint or sometimes spectacular in inarticulateness or sometimes spectacular in simply emotion and and so i think that what we are kind of basically probably experiencing both of us that from outside our range is is limited and eroded uh, because of the narrowing of the spectacular so, and, and and that's why i want to i want to <laughs> answer this in the same but different way. We were in a competition for a railroad station with Zaha. Uh, she won. Um, I think we came into, you know, we, we take, we keep score of these times we lose to Zaha. Uh, uh, she's my hero, actually. But out of this competition, the regional governor, Bassolino, said, well, you know, I really liked Eisenman's better, we should have won, blah, blah. So Eisenman, you're gonna do your station now in Pompeii. We have a direct commission to do a station in Pompeii, but the guy wants me to do the same damn station, right? And of course, I don't wanna do that station, and I certainly don't wanna do it in Pompeii. And the thing is, it, there was a huge headline in the paper, Eisenman Grifata, which means Eisenman's signature, yeah. right? And, and, and yeah. there it is all over Naples in this big headline. You should do Canaretio now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're stuck. The same thing. Every time I go to an interview, I said, I always say, we will give you a unique signature, right? I, and, and that's what they want to hear. So you get chosen. Or we will give you an icon. You can't go and say, we're going to give you a non-icon icon because that's not what they want. We're in a competition against Jean Nouvel now and, and Tom Main and et cetera. They want a signature project, right? And I'm so tired of doing signature projects, but it's the clients. You know, when they ask Richard Meyer to do a project, let's take some neutral figure, right? Uh, <laughs> that Ben and I started our life with. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, they, they, they want a Richard Meyer. He knows how to do that. He's been producing that. Now there's a guy that made a lot of money, but I forget he's even got a foundation, out of doing the same damn thing over and over and over again. He has no problem with it, uh, you know. And, and the, the thing is, Rem and I do have a, that's why we're at this table and Richard isn't in a certain way because uh, he has the signature. I have to say, I was in Rome a couple of weeks ago and Richard Meyer's posters were everywhere in the city and, yeah. so, and the Conservative Party had taken his project and pasted really? their logo on it and the Agip petrol station on top of his building <laughs> and performed the same kind of operation. But, but, uh, so neutrality yeah, is a What you're saying tool. almost makes me cry. Uh, <laughs> because uh, well, because you don't uh, 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 Richard Meyer. That's why Richard Meyer is not on this table. You know, we are dummies. I mean, it's not. Uh, it's not that we are so smart mm. that kind of Richard Meyer cannot. Can, uh, can, but we are so stupid that we are on this table. Uh, and 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 I think that you also have to kind of really uh, deeply respect Richard Meyer 
for you know something that we were neither one of us was able to do which is to resist the lure of 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 difference and uh and and and, and the spectacle even so i've actually been kind of rethinking my uh, the past uh, couple of years <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as somebody who, who may have been kind of a, a lot more uh, intelligent than we gave him credit for. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and I would like to also correct your initial anecdote, because what, what Peter forgot to say is that kind of Richard Meyer, every time he had to give a lecture, came to the office of his uh, cousin Peter to uh, <laughs> basically <laughs> prepare the lecture and kind of uh, have Peter write the script. And so, so, so so, and, and we had basically seen Meyer and Peter for four <coughs> hours in that uh, uh, in Peter's room with their feet on the table, and and so well, the reason that Peter was angry was that we basically attacked his script <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and not the dumbness of Richard Meyer. <laughs> yeah, the the thing is, though, Rem, to argue against uh, that and to raise another ghost in the room. Uh, when Colin Rowe and I used to go around looking at Greek temples, and they seemed all the same to him and to me, he'd said, always used to say, you'd think those guys could have done something else in 300 years. So um, I have a feeling that I'm not sure I'm on the side of doing the same thing for mm -hmm. a lifetime. I, I think it gets rather boring. And you know, well, you I don't like... You certainly believe in repetition. <laughs> <laughs> I would think, you know, Rem, I, 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 don't want to, I don't want you to cry because um, uh, n nobody drug you here, right? I mean, and, and nobody drags you to the places that you go. You know, you're a free spirit. You can always say no. And um, I'm, I'm glad you did come tonight. And uh, I'm glad I'm talking to somebody like you rather than talking to some other people. So uh, I, please don't cry. <laughs> Okay, I think we'll stop there. Thank you, everybody, and Peter and Rem. Thank you very much for the evening. Okay. Yeah, it's very good. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Was great. Thank you, everybody. Just to just to say, Act Two will be on Wednesday evening. Um, Peter and Rem have to leave to get back to work. Uh, they are invited in for an evening that Mark Cousins will host here um, with Jeffrey Kipnis and Bob Somel, who've both written extensively on, on um, the characters on either side of me this evening, um, and carry forward the conversation in a different format that evening. Please come in and join us for that. It'll be 7 o'clock on, on Wednesday, and you're all welcome. Thanks very much. <coughs> that was great. That was okay. Great. <laughs> hey, Ram, that wasn't too uh, conversational. It was, it was good. It was worthwhile. Except I didn't get to do the legacy at the end. I wanted to do the legacy. No, no. But it was worthwhile. Yeah. That was good. It's a pedagogy and legacy at the end. Yeah, it's good. Is this the end or is it against me, though? The dinner's up in the front members' room.